Welcome to Money Congos, where we discuss personal finance and investment tips. We are committed to helping people create wealth and achieve financial freedom. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube and podcast. Alright then, let's head into today's conversation. Hi everyone, thank you for joining today's session. I see Lee, Eleanor, nice to see you in here. Not sure if I've seen you in here before, but yeah, very nice. And um, Adam, Charlie, come on up here. Dali, join us up here if you'd like. Charlie, Adam, how are you doing? Hello, Ali Kim, Charlie. I'm doing good. Yourself? I'm fine, my brother. I'm fine. It's been a minute. It has been. It has been. Wait, last week were you active? Were you an active speaker last week? Last week I had challenges with my connection, so uh, you, okay. but I couldn't really, I couldn't speak at a point. So ah, yes, yes. yes. Hopefully audience, today I don't have glad to have you back. Yeah, uh, yeah. Speaking of long lost people, Prince is back after going to achieve all his twenty twenty three goals. Sally, I'm, I'm so happy to see you. Prince. So. <laughs> So, Prince, please join our square. I nearly said Prince. <laughs> Don't worry. It's allowed. You stay there for some time. Mm. <laughs> Just fine. <laughs> Charlie, people just catching stray bullets. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Charlie, so right now, me, in fact, instead of asking how are you, I have a question. I have a question for you. Have you have has has somebody stolen your thirty million dollars before? Hey, <laughs> not thirty million dollars, no, we can't do it. This this reminds me of there's this guy on um, on a Ghanaian radio show, Oliver Twist, Oliver Khan, Oliver Khan, yeah, Oliver Khan. He's he's on Bright Can Comes. Uh, he and Bright Can Come have a, a show. I've forgotten the exact name. Let me let me just. In which channel it is on on IG? The guy just entertains me, man. And the guy can talk. The guy can talk. Oh my days! The guy can talk. He he was even with was it Chrissy or Ting? He went for an event at Chrissy or Ting. This is somebody who has like Bugatti and like Rolls Royces and things. Okay, I don't know about Bugatti, but definitely a couple of Rolls Royces, a lot of luxury cars, and he was seeing all those as small cars. Imagine. But anyway. Anyway, hopefully, maybe if we invite him, he can tell us about how people have stolen his thirty million dollars and it was pocket change for him. Prince, how are you doing? Hey, well, okay, I'm doing fine. Yourself? I'm great, my brother. I'm doing good. Doing good. It's been a long time. Yeah? It has been. I know you've been fighting the good fights, uh-huh. and now your your pressure has reduced small. So we are glad to yeah, have you join yeah, us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, speaking of people we've missed, if David ever hears this, we've missed David. So, David, please come back to us. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The last, yeah, yeah. Papa, oh, it's time. been a long time. It has been, it has been. <laughs> hit him up on WhatsApp, man. Hit, hit him up and check up on him. I check up on him every couple of weeks. Yeah. Anyway, Delali, how are you doing? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Nice. How have you been? Charlie, I've been, I've been okay. I won't go. It's, it's, it's cold out here, man. It's cold out here, but it's all good. You are not, you are not okay. You are not okay. <laughs> yes. Come again? <laughs> I can hear from your voice that you are not okay. Charlie, there's pressure, but, you know, we manage it. Okay. We handle it. Okay. Anyway, today we are coming to talk about rich people's problems. Or celebrities' problems, and it was some the average problem. <laughs> you know, the, the average person will be like, "Is the how does yeah. this matter to us?" But you know, we are here trying to spread the good news of financial independence. So every now and then, we need to remind people that as we are trying to help them become financially independent and wealthy, there are certain problems that they will face. So we need to start priming them for those kind of problems. Yeah, the risk that you'll be there and someone will steal your 12, 13 million dollars. That's a, that's a concern we need to prepare our people for because I have a lot of faith in the fact that in five, ten years to come, people who've been listening to Mandy Convos 
to have this kind of money in their back pocket. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, so let's let's get into the crust of the matter. I have a friend, shout out to Felicia. Um, she's Jamaican, she's in the US, she's a friend of mine, and she, she drew, drew my attention to this story. And it's that um, Usain Bolt uh, has, Usain Bolt invested some money in, a, in a, an investment firm in, in Jamaica, his home country, and the account was worth about 12.7 million dollars um, the company was stocks and securities limited in jamaica and early this year the news came out that the company was involved in a fraud scheme one of their employees from all looks of things they are trying to say is one employee who has been involved in the fraud and has defrauded i'm seeing and it's hard to believe this but i'm seeing up to three billion dollars from this company. One person, um, a, a lady, uh, can't quite recall her name, but she had been with the firm for twenty years, and she said she started this, this um, taking money from people's accounts in twenty ten. I'll get a little more into the story of how it happened, but uh, yeah, so far that's that's the headline. I, has any, has anyone else picked up on this story? Any or any details about this story that shocked you? Yeah, I think I read about it somewhere last month or two months ago. Mm-hmm. But I didn't really go into the details. But from the look of things, it looks like it, it, it was just a scam. I, I don't know about the individual person ripping the whole company off, but most of the times, to me, it will... Well, I'm hearing this now that it was one person, and to me, it's like a scapegoat kind of thing. Oh, let's just blame it on one person, and then probably create an imaginary person that can be found in the entirely. It would be a manhunt for a non-existent person in the entirely. You know, man is gone, and it's 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 interesting you talk about like uh, pinning it on one person. It's, it's a concern I had, but well. The, it seems the that's what that's what all the news is saying that this person has wrote a statement I and mean, I've even seen like copies of the statements on the internet and all that but the person has admitted what she's what she's done a list of is it thirty some some reports are saying thirty people, some are saying forty people. What's interesting though mm-hmm. is that you saying Boots name is not in that list of people that she stole from. Hmm. He said his twelve point seven million is gone and it's left with only twelve thousand dollars. <laughs> and he and you know what the lad you were saying about um, mm-hmm. the um, public re- like pop- the story that is going. Yeah, people are trying to pin it on one person. Yeah. He using both tweeted or put it on IG. He said something about uh, the like you have to see through all the noise. Some, something like that. Uh, basically, trying to say that. You have no, to but, stay full because don't let anybody distract you from the real issue. Yeah, but to me, here's the thing. If I do mm-hmm. an investment with, say, um, a bank, right, <clears throat> or a company, mm-hmm. and then you come and tell me that it is one person who has done that, you, I don't care. I did the company, the business with you, the company, and not that individual. So whatever happens, Fine, you found a person. Retrieve the money from the person. But that is none of my business. My business is you with me and you, the bank. Not whoever did whatever. You get my point? Because I think mm. most people kind of, oh, it was... So they take money and then they're like, oh, it was management that did this, management that, or a worker that did this. And then it's like, okay, let's... Um, okay, so when we find the person. But like ideally, you're supposed to take responsibility for it. Because you should have done your background checks when you're brain or whatever, or however you, you got in, into working with the person involved, right? So if something happens, these are people's money, then you, do you expect me to say $30 million? For so all you know, that is my lifetime savings. So what do you want me to do with it? Yeah, I, I feel you. Who should take the responsibility? Um, Lee, can you please mute? There's some background noise. Yeah, yeah. 
so yeah who should take the responsibility it's a very good point that you raise and I'll, I'll drop some information that will shake that so let me give some more details and then i'll circle back to what you just said so a, a couple more pointers on this story and i hope sarah and Mimi can come in there because it's, it's, it's getting me thinking about you know private world services and and, and and the like so it said um this 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 story started the person said she started taking money out of the account in 2010 her father was sick and had to go overseas so she started taking money out then eventually the father died after three years then her bro- her brother her brother tried to kill the mother so the mother had to be put in a in a special facility that one to and then covid happened the income from her main job started reducing and all that but this person was uh is it customer relationship manager something like that or customer service manager not even anyone in finance so i guess you wonder how the person get this kind of access to the money right let's talk about the use of the money or the the purpose of this investment you simple this money was for his pension you know he retired in 2017 so this money was for his pension he takes care of his family his parents and he has three children you understand so this is money that he was going to use for the rest of his life. And you, his life, and you know, with athletes, this their career is, is while they are young, and that's when they make their they make the bulk of their money in their twenties and thirties, and then they have to relive the rest of their life on whatever they've earned. These days, we are seeing that athletes are able to you know use their star power and their popularity, their know how to get other jobs in maybe media or. Um, advertising or whatever, like there are new newer sources of income from there. But this is money he's earned from all his actual athletic activities, and so a portion of it is gone. He later said that yeah, it's, he's not going to go broke over this, but it shook him a bit. But uh, yeah, more of that in a bit. Now back to what Lee you were saying. Who did the person deal with? So the list doesn't even include his name, and according to a former. A CEO of SSL, he resigned in 2022, I think, yeah, 2022, June. And, and even the current employees of the firm, apparently, they didn't even know that Usain Bolt or any of his affiliated companies were clients of the firm. And that they, they believe that he was only engaging with this one person. So he raises the question how was he engaging? He or his people, because he, he's even out of this scandal, fired his fina- his his money ma- his business manager. I, th- I think that's the title, business manager, because of this uh, scandal that like, lost trust the person. Um, like, what kind of engagements was he having that even that he wasn't on the the company's books? And it makes me think about um, when I was in private wealth. How I was managing these relationships, Sarah, Mimi, I'm, I'm curious. Like, if you if you're in a position to talk, you know, come let's let's have this conversation. It gets when you are dealing with rich people, and it's it's and celebrities, people who are popular. Right, I've realized that quite often they tend to sur- surround themselves with people they can trust. Of course, they don't just easily trust anybody, but once they start trusting somebody. Sometimes they don't um, they don't think twice. Like the number of times I've walked around on the streets with hundreds of thousands of dollars on me. Why? Because someone just called me out of the blue. Oh, come! We are just having a chat, and all the person drops block in my hand, and I quickly have to scramble. Sometimes some places I'm going, and I'm going. I need driver to go with you know, and it's, it's we normally say in the banking sector. Don't give money to anybody in the. Um, don't give money to anybody who is not a teller behind the teller desk. You know, a lot of these banks, you go and you you have to give. No matter who you know, you have to give money to the person in the teller booth. But with private wealth services, for example, which I can imagine, you know, they will be treating using boats like the person is too busy to come today to the office you understand to the bank so you would have to go to his office some some banks will actually come with a bullion van at least you know there's police security you know so you need to put all those structures in place 
I've no I've heard about a friend many years ago. Her brother was in a bank in in, in Ghana, and uh, he he took somebody's a, a customer of his. He was a teller. A customer of his was in a hurry, wanted to deposit. He was out going for lunch, and the person just gave him money. The money on the side of the road, across from the bank. It would, the, the the money was snatched from him in no time, and now it became his his problem to deal with. You know, so then the, it, it becomes a question of what kind of trust do we repose in people, especially let's let's even start with people in banks, before we come to uh, these celebrities and their uh, money managers and business managers. Um, Mimi, any thoughts on this? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's quite a serious issue. It raises. And hello, everyone. So it raises a number of issues. Um, for me, when I go and see a client and they are paying any money, I ensure that the first of all, I don't take cash. Secondly, um, the if it's an account number, it will be the uh, because I work in pensions. I'll see the schemes accounts details. If it's a check, it will be in the name of the scheme, the particular scheme. So I'm wondering how the money go to the lady. You know, did she did he give her cash? Or was it a check? And cash, I feel it's a bit tricky. Yes, you can trust people, but even me, it's not like I don't trust myself. But picking someone's cash, anything can happen, like you you just mentioned. So for me, if I'm going to even pay somebody's money, which is not even the norm at my place, I'll ask for a check. I won't say cash. If you have cash, I'll probably direct you to where you can pay. Or even if it's money, maybe like from these retail people who maybe will give you some hundred and two hundred, even that I don't do it often. So... I think it's, and, and even builds trust, you know, when you give the account, the right account details. I don't know what the finance, his finance guy was doing. I am forced to think that um, he was in bed with this lady um, to dupe him because it doesn't make any sense. I think you should have checked some of these things. And then why would you put all that money? Well, I don't know his entire wealth, so... Maybe he had diversified, I don't know. But I feel like maybe it's it's also a lot of money to just put in one place. And for all these years, not... Do I, they don't have a statement or something like... Or they falsified it or there was no AGM, there was no review or it's with the same lady. Like, wouldn't it have been nice to see someone else's face? or to see from somewhere else that you have money here than the same person telling you everything. When it comes to money, especially the financial sector, there's a lot of fraud when the systems and structures are not in place because look at this person. We all have problems and you see money. You may be tempted to um, let your guard down and, you know, go in for someone's money, depending on your value. So I also think that it's out, up to the organization to put in the systems and structures. That's why I think that they are also to be blamed and they are also liable because once I am going out with your name, whatever I do, you, 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 are, you have to take responsibility for it. So... In, in in my own um, words, that's why I think. And I don't know why she would take all this money, solve the father's sickness, and you need $3 million for what, what kind of sickness is that? And what kind of facility did she have to take? Did she have to take her mom to, to be able to steal all this money? Why not steal maybe $10,000? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me anyway. Maybe they say it's three billion or billion. Ah, boy, mm. <laughs> as, as, uh, that number even scares me, right? And you are saying something about structures, and I find it interesting. And I was actually quite impressed that the the head of the the equivalent of Securities and Exchange Commission there resigned when the saga came out. 
So he, he actually resigned. I'm like, okay, at least people are taking accountability, you know, but that doesn't uh, solve the problem. Money is not gotten back into people's accounts. So yeah, that's, that, that's a concern. Um, Lee, you can go ahead with your thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, when you were making your submission, what came to mind was money talks. Like money talks, right? <clears throat> so um, there was this man who actually all his, his banking transactions were after banking hours. Because um, I was told if he decided to withdraw, like he he's into import and export. And when he wants to, when he makes an order and he wants to make payment, um, sometimes the, the bank will have to be on hold. Because immediately he makes that payment, it means transactions can't go on for probably half of the day. So his his transactions are mostly after banking hours. So some people do their banking outside. It is with the bank, but still outside the bank. And all I can say is money talks. But then I wanted to ask with the issue of the the scapegoat, right? <clears throat> so supposing you are working with a firm, and then um, they've 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 stolen three billion dollars. Right, or they've, they've embezzled three billion dollars, and they ask you, okay, you know what? <clears throat> Take the four, and we'll give you three million dollars. What will you do? Wait, come again. So you take the four, and then they will they will that yes. the three billion. Yes. Oh, me, I have I have values. I, I Is have it? Values. I have very strong <laughs> values. So see no evil, hear no evil. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. So, I'll be honest. so um, you, usually for me, this is what I, I, I see happening in most of these, um, like banking scams and stuff, right? Because definitely there's money to be made, and whether consciously or unconsciously, people are involved, right? Like people who are, um, who should be, um be checking these things will be involved one day one way or the other and definitely hands will be wrapped so um, the resignation sometimes oh yeah he's doing a good job but what what is the impact of the resignation right because it's like maybe you are the head you're supposed to solve the issue and then you resign so who are you leaving the mess to come and clean up to who who cleans up after you right so yeah you are to me resigning is not being accountable because if there's a mess, get to the the root of it, solve it, and then you resign. Like okay, so based on the fact that I was the head before this thing happened, I've cleaned up, but then I'm resigning. Then that I can say, oh yeah, you are being accountable, you are being responsible. But immediately the issue comes up, then you resign. To me, uh, that doesn't cut it. That's that's an interesting perspective, and I, I get what you mean by um, the. P- the person, or oh, I see some merit to yes, somebody should stay on. But with with some of these situations, when someone causes a mess, exactly better they step away because they they a lot of it, it may, the problem may have happened out of negligence. But see, we don't know. What if the the, the problem happened maliciously? Is the person in a position such that you, if you keep them in that position, they can actually try to. Um, um, cause further damage or affect the investigations. So you let people step aside. And also, one form of punishment for messing things up is being fired. When you lose your job, it, t- it tarnishes your reputation. Like it would be hard for anyone to to give to give you a job again. I remember when I was uh, starting my after university, I was going to start work, and an uncle gave me advice. He's like, See, if if I fire you from my company, he's he's into medical equipment supply and among other things like if i fire from my company you don't want case but you're going to work in a bank if you are fired from a bank whether you it was because you were just consistently late to work or whatever people will just assume you stole money that also has some in, in, implication i totally get that be him resigning him being fired it doesn't take it doesn't bring back the money it doesn't correct the harm but i also think that the person needs to step away. It's an acknowledgement of responsibility 
and I, I feel like just think about Ghana, Ghana, a lot of Ghana situations, not just the on the, the biggest national skills. Like a lot of things, a lot of fiascos happen, a lot of people drop the ball, and yet we see zero punishment. The people continue in their roles, like nothing happened. But when you compare with other jurisdictions, where when there's a problem, you get fired, you get suspended, somebody else will come and try to fix the situation. And they will make it somebody else's responsibility that, hey, we are hiring you to fix this thing. That person will even have more energy to try to fix it because they know the mandate upon which they were they were um, hired. You know, so um, that's that's a concern. I guess this is part of why uh, there were some some months ago there were calls for the Minister of Finance's resignation. You know, that was some of the things that were was raised. But to your question, to your question, and it's, it's interesting, I think it's a question we should perhaps go around. It's, it's kind of deviating a bit, but uh, we should go around and ask our finance professionals. Oh, good, Serum has come up stage. So if you are being offered a certain amount of money, it's effectively a bribe, right? Take the fall or do something. I, I'll start with my experience. When I compare the my experience, my early career experience, I'm really glad I started work in the company I did, we, you know, at Money Convos, we don't advertise names too much. So pardon me. The, the company th- um, thrives a lot on or, or takes values very seriously. We don't take gifts. When I got into private world, that's when the gifts, a lot of times the gifts used to come. Like a client would actually take me out to his car, put a gift in my hand and quickly drive off. Or I'm not in the office, they'll just drop it off with the receptionist and I have to send an email to the legal, to legal, they do all the necessary recording just to make sure that down the line, there's no misappropriation. If it's something that we can share, so keep it in the office so that end of year when we are sharing all the hampers and stuff that we received, it just joins the pool. I didn't benefit directly, you know, some of these things. There, was, there have been times when people have offered like bundles of cash to some of my colleagues. I haven't been in that situation. Ah, actually, I've been in a similar one. Someone offered uh, uh, a bundle of cash to a, a colleague of mine and my HOD, you know, the very great Nian Patua. I think uh, he, he announced it at a unit meeting or a department meeting. And when we when people heard it, it's, we, we all just give the person a standing ovation. What's my say? It's, it's like, those were some of the badges of honor. There was one time, I kid you not, I was broke. I was broke that time. I went to see one, one of my favorite clients. And this person is notorious for giving cash gifts. And he had just returned from the U.S. And he puts, he gave me a card and a, a, a necktie. Oh, necktie, yes. It's not much valued much. I can just declare it and then I'll go. But something was like, nah, nah. Open this package before you leave here. Lo and behold, there was, was it $200 in the thing? Or either 100 or $200. Then I, and I went back to him and I was like, oh, say, please, you know, I can't take this. Then I gave it back. I went to sit in my car. See, I was hungry that day. I was broke. <laughs> that $200 would have done a lot to change my life. You know, but I, I go back to the office. I, I shared this with a couple of people. And just the general spirit in the office just remind you that you are, do, you are doing the right thing. So it also has to do with structures. What's the company culture that can help keep you going and doing the right thing? So, um, yeah. I'm curious how other people have experienced this. Sarah, welcome upstage. If your choristers are not disturbing you, have you had any similar experiences? Um, yes, but early came from what you mm-hmm. have said. So it's assuming some of us would have taken the cash. Now we can't even share. See how <laughs> it is. With... So um, it's. Uh, for for positions of being offered money, yes, I have been in such um, positions. But again, it de- sometimes it really depends on the client. But as you said, once you declare it at the, you declare it at work. There have been instances. Okay, so I used to work with. I've wor- I interned in, a, in an institution, a financial institution that has collapsed, right? And then I remember it used to do loans. So what happened was um, the credit officer facilitated a loan facility for someone. Then um, I think it was was then a hundred thousand or so, 
and his repayment was going to be around 2,000 CDs on a monthly basis, around that. Uh, maybe I don't have the figures right. Then um, when the loan was successful, he gave him, was it 5,000 CDs, and he took it. Then um, three months down the line, he started defaulting on the loan. And when they started pushing him, he said that, oh, he made some of the payments to this credit officer. And the guy was fired. So that was um, a major lesson for me. This was, um, I, I think I was yet to even do my national service. I was just interning there for the period. So this that was a lesson for me. So since then, I am all, always very mindful of clients and then their gifts. So I always ensure that I declare. There are those times that um, low so 10 CDs, 5 CDs, those ones, when I was in a bank, I remember those when I was in a banking home, 5 CDs, 10 CDs, we have a, a, a jar that would put it in there. But when it's quite a, a lot of money, where a lot of money to me is 500 CDs, 200, 500 CDs above, you always have to declare it just to be on the safe side. Yeah, you declare it. You declare it. And then that, that, like your legal team can come and give an opinion and they make sure that you are not favoring this person. Some people just will even monitor the kind of relationship you have with this person. Do you give them preferential treatment and all of that because all those can pose a risk such that sometime down the line, this person will come and engage in this behavior. I, 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 this just even just thinking around like, the kind of people we engage with at work. It reminds me, I have a client, rich woman. She doesn't have, she doesn't have time to be doing some of these things. So when she when she needs me, she call me, she summon me somewhere. She's she's in a spa somewhere getting a facial. You know what what business does she have to come and stand in the bank and queue? Very rich woman though. At best, you say okay, you you let let call my call my business manager and let him handle this issue. So it then raises this kind of concern. So. If if there's an if if these two people, the person on the bank side and the business manager are both unscrupulous, then they will take advantage of this, you know. So, man, it's tough. Mimi, how about you? Have you ex- have you seen any such things or experienced any such things? <clears throat> yes, and um, I mean, just like you both said, with my company, they've made it very clear, um, that you are not supposed to take the money. And so I think recently I shared with you a um, a story of a shopping voucher. I went to receive, I went to do some presentations for some workers being laid off. And um, it was about three different presentations. And then later, just I think last month or so, when I needed the money the most, the lady called me that, oh, some shopping voucher or something. But that lady in particular, nah, she's some star already. Even though on a normal day, I would I would not agree to take it. She is also another. So I was like, oh, no, I can't take it, blah, blah, blah. And then she's like, she's bringing it anyway. So there was this guy that had an issue, a retiree. So he, she gave the voucher to him to bring to me. I mean, I've forgotten about the thing, Chris. So when the guy came, I saw to him and he gave me the thing. I walked straight to wherever I was supposed to go to and reported it. And so it was logged in and they were like, okay, I mean, I can take it. So I, I took it. I shared with my team member and I went to do my shopping. <laughs> yeah, so that was one. There was another one too that we went to do some presentation somewhere. And then they said, oh, they should have bought us lunch, but they couldn't get us lunch. So, I mean, they would give us, I think they gave us 200 CDs, where two, so 200 CDs to share. And when we went, my other colleague, at that time, yeah, I didn't really agree because it said lunch. But anyway, my other colleague um, decided to go and declare the money. So he went to declare it, and then my boss said we should return the money. The people too said we we'll receive it. So um, I think he asked us to leave it with the admin. It was with her uh, back and forth, back and forth. It wasn't going, and then they also called us and gave it back to us 
which was also nice. But <laughs> um, on a normal day, I I would I'll try my best um, to. I think it has even been difficult for me. I've even mixed personal opportunities where people have called me personally that come and present and they give me money. I don't take it. Then I realized that ah, this was my opportunity. So I've changed that thing. Please, if you call me, I'll collect the money. But um, initially, it, it even affected my own like personal um, gigs. I'll, I'll also not collect money if you call me. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Uh, so so people should know now that if you call me, we should take it. You know, this the, as we are exchanging these stories, it just reminds me of uh, many experiences. But the reason why we are even sharing these discuss uh, these stories is just for you to understand. Like the key question is, who can you trust, and what are some of the engagements you can be having, or the interactions you can be having with the people you think you can trust? And we'll get to how you can verify these things. But a couple more stories with me have when Mimi said uh, you, are, you are trying to re- retain money to someone the person said they won't take I had this a similar experience like that again clients put their money in something that I wouldn't have seen I go to the and no in fact no I was still in their office yes I was still in their office give me the envelope I said I'm sorry I can't take it he said no they're they not taking it back so and I said okay fine we have a foundation so I donated to the foundation, and it's like, well, if that's what you want, that's good. But they are giving me the money. So lo and behold, I went when I got to the office, I deposited it in the foundation's account and sent them a receipt. So yeah, that that's another way you can avoid it because that money was too much. It was too much. I wasn't even comfortable declaring that as personal one. But I still did even share it with the legal team, but then it didn't come to me, so it's not too big of a concern. I recall many years ago when when I was having my wedding, some of my clients who found out later that I had a wedding were offended. Why? Why didn't you tell us about your wedding? Only one client actually came for, uh, came for my wedding. I think it's because me, me and him go way back and we've gotten very deep, you know. And others were offended. And I told one that, honestly, the way me and you are, if I invite you to my wedding, chances are you'll give me a gift. And I don't want to deal with that. Back then, I was very young. If not now that I'm older and I could navigate some of these things easier and my, I could build a case easier, you know. So back then, I didn't want to risk anything. But still, you know how in Ghana, people can be quite, you know, people prefer to be more cordial and more friendly. And the way I am with you, but how can you not, you know. So it rubs some people off the wrong way, but eventually we salvage those things. I would, I would rather do that than risk my young career uh, for such a such an issue yeah anyway so now I, 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 I'm curious about how we can how do we know that we are engaging with people we can trust I guess uh, we've talked about making sure that you are receiving statements but how can you even check if it's a falsified statement I guess an easy one an easy way to go is just show up at the bank uh, or yeah, the bank or whichever financial institution out of the blue, unannounced, and try to talk to a manager. You know, try to get them to pull reports for you right there and then. Can we think of any other ways we can try to avoid being scammed in this way? Mimi? Ellie Kim, I, I think that that's ideal if maybe the place has an office um in the in your country but in the in these days where fintech is becoming a thing that becomes a bit more difficult um because um i i mean i remember when we were, we started investing on this app um i tried proving and uh, finding out who was behind what was behind it and funny enough for somebody i knew so i called the person asked questions even with that I was still sort of unsettled because it's like if an issue happens, like where are you going to stand? Even though they have an office um, around. And so for me, I think that with an issue like that, apart from me, um, you know, doing my background checks, I would still not put all my money there. You get it. I'll still diversify because... Sometimes people can do some 
very interesting, uh, what do you call it, things. And you would never, especially if you are not a professional or you are not used to that kind of thing, you can never really tell that, you know, somebody is working you. So for me, one way of doing that is not to put all my, my eggs in one basket. And especially if there is, it's not a place that I can see, that I know that I can easily go and deal with them. I think I'll have a cap as to how much I invest there. I, I, I think I may not go beyond a certain amount. That is me. And that's my own way um, of managing risk. Um, one thing I've also come to notice um, uh, from this whole debt restructuring and the aftermath is that normally when people give you their money, I think they don't care about what you do with their money. That's what I'm thinking. All they care about is their returns, which is very, very terrible. I think that wherever you invest your money, you should know the underlying assets. You should know who the like you should dig deeper to find out what is behind, you know, that investment. It's not just, oh, they say 100 CDs a month. So you just do the direct debit and drop it. And then that is it. I think we need to start probing a bit more, you know, because it's, it's, things are just get. I mean, life is risky. Investments are risky. There are certain risks that you can manage, right? And this is one of them. So be probing and finding out, you know, about um, the investment you are doing, I think it's a very good way. I remember some time ago when this whole men's gold <clears throat> issue happened, me, we're looking for opportunities to present. I don't even know why we decided to go there, probably desperate times. I never believed in their model because of one or two things I thought were fishy. But when I went to the office, um, to their office, and I think we wanted to, we were asking for a presentation and the front desk person was the one who gave us the presentation. I don't know, everything was wrong because in a normal correct organization there are systems and structures maybe hr is in charge of this i i think that there are red flags that if you really like open your eyes to and if you are really deliberate ask questions you may end up finding out certain things and if you are not comfortable just maybe don't do it that's what i i, I would see don't put all your eggs in one basket and prove so that you can find the red flags okay okay that's cool Adam, how about you? Any ideas? Yeah, Elikem. Um, hmm. I think this story, there are a lot of issues that are quite funny. Like Mimi has raised a number of issues, like some red flags concerning um, this whole situation. I mean, you mentioned earlier that a former um, um, is it MD or something was saying that it looks as though he was not even a client or, or like there was no established relationship between him and the company to start with. So I think that when we are trying to deal with some of these people uh, with our investments, we should be very careful that when we are having our, maybe let's say communications. I remember in one instance when I was dealing with one of the uh, I think customer service reps or something. The person kept, in, I think normally sometimes when I write the email, I just sent it to the person. She kept saying that, look, anytime you are communicating with me, make sure you copy this person, this person, this person. You know, so one thing you can always be, how who are the people you'll be communicating with? Is it only one person you always are dealing with when it's got to do with you? It's just one person, every time one person at the firm. That should um, also make you feel a bit jittery. So obviously if it's a company, then there are more than one persons who are responsible to handle so many things. So you can't be dealing with one person all the time over a period of let's say three years or four years. Definitely somebody should have gone on leave. Somebody should have fallen sick one day or something. Like so that's one way at least who are you communicating with? I think Mimi also raised an issue earlier about when she picks um if the person has to pay money, definitely the person is paying into the company coffers or she's picking up a check. Who are you sending the money to? Is the money going to a personal person? And I, I know sometimes 
you even mentioned this in like the banks. People like, to, oh, my friend is here. You just drop this th- or put this thousand in my account. I don't want to stay in the in the queue. What if it doesn't get uh, uh, deposited? What if it doesn't get credited? So all these things are some of the things we can be looking at so that we don't fall victim to um, what happened to both. Because for me, it looks like because he had a business manager, the person was he outsourced everything to the person. That's for me. That's my reading or my interpretation of the the articles I've read so far. It's as though he was handling everything. So Mimi rightly said, "There's so much that is off about this." I'm sure the business manager was definitely in cahoots with whoever pulled this off, and it couldn't have been just one person at the firm who did this. More than one person did that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Engage with more people, more than one person. Um, there re- in emails, there's that reply all feature. Sometimes people just reply to one. And meanwhile, there's the official group email in there that is always in copy, and they miss that out sometimes. It's it's, it's just. You know, when you talk to auditors, they tell you one of the controls is, or a concern for them is a staff member who never goes on leave. If you have a staff member who never goes on leave, that's always a red flag because the person is not going for someone else to come and check the thing, for the to check the work that they are doing. Maybe out of negligence or out of outright um, fraudulent activities going on. So yeah, that's something to look out for. Lee, how about you? You got some ideas for us? Did you say Lee or Mimi? Uh, Lee. Ah, okay. <laughs> I can't see you number one. Um, so, um, <clears throat> I think you made mention of uh, visiting the physical bank, right? And I remember there was this convo we had. Um, this bank, HSBC, I think um, from one convo, so it was... Um, it was an online bank, and they don't have a brick and mortar um, like structure, <clears throat> right? So, such a, a bank, how do you walk in and be like um, interacting with someone? Because it's always, always online or on the phone. Yeah. Anyway, I hear the, the it was through them that someone who their motto was call them in their ways. Yeah. <laughs> The Sorry, Lee, your net your connection is getting a bit faint. You're seeing it's an online bank. <clears throat> hello? Yeah, hello. Am I audible now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I was saying HSBC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I'm told they started... It's an online bank. I don't know now if they have mm, a brick and No, really? Yeah. Maybe they offer an online banking service, but no. Okay, well, I I was told it's it's an on it's it's an online bank, and they didn't have the brick and mortar structure, so um, with such a bank, right, something that is strictly online, well, it's not here in Ghana though. I don't know if there's any strictly online banks in Ghana, but with such um an institution, how do you go and say I interacted with this person? I know someone from the bank personally and this is the person i always interact with when i go or this personal is who i always do my transactions with like how do you go about that yes so for me um being uh how do you call it being careful with your money yeah you have to do your background checks like serious background checks right and even um with the established banks if there's an investment I always go online to do what what are they investing in how what are people saying about their investments and all that like do do the necessary checks right for me that is that is what I do I do the necessary checks and Mimi also made mention of um people just giving their money to the banks and then forget about it they don't care what you do they just want their returns and Part of that, I think, has to do with people who are always preaching the financial freedom and financial literacy thing, like, be financially free. So people say, okay, let me just find a bank, give them the money, they will do the magic and I'll get my money. So I think part of the problem comes from that. Everybody wants to, you know, make money. And that also 
makes it very easy for people to be scammed because everybody wants to be free financially, right? So, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, people are trying, to, I don't know how to put it, it's like, we are raising the skill here and it's causing another problem on the other side. So, it's like, you 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 have to put in a lot of effort to find a balance. And most people don't want to put in the work, right? So, it's easy, I would say, we end up um, presenting ourselves to be scammed because we want to get to a certain level and we are not putting in the work to actually um, do the checks that will take us there. So we have to be a bit more um, involved, right, with our money. And like you said, don't put all your money in one basket. Okay. Interesting. I, I see Mimi wants to speak. Mimi, uh, I'll, I'll just quickly comment and then we, we hear from Mimi. So you asked the question right at the top about for these online banks, how do you know? I don't think no, I don't think there's any online bank in Ghana unless something like this has come up in the last seven months since I left. I don't think so. Um, so in Ghana, no. In the US, I have a, I know an, of an example, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. See, it's, it's Marcus is an online bank, but it's linked to Goldman Sachs. Like, you know, it, it comes with a certain credibility uh, of the, the larger group. There are many online-only banks in the U.S. So what do you do? You go to the regulator. You can't outsource your due diligence 100%. And this comes back to what you were saying at the end. It's, it's part of the adulting. And I were talking about adulting a couple of hours ago. It's part of adulting. You can't leave certain responsibilities be that, okay? You just leave it to the financial people. You have to do some investigation to know who can you trust. And in in, can, in well-organized systems, we we delegate some of this due diligence to the regulators. So then when the regulators fail us, it becomes a problem. So what do you do? You go find who is the relevant regulator. And quite often in the conversations that we have in on Money Convos, we, we, we mention who are the regulators. Uh, you should be looking out for and check their website. So if it comes to your the normal banking transactions in Ghana, that's your current account, savings account, fixed deposits, even if you want to buy treasury bills, you know, it's, it's, you go to a commercial bank. I think the technical term is universal bank in Ghana, savings and loans. You go to, they are regulated by the Bank of Ghana. That's the regulator. You go to bog.gov.gh. They keep a list of, um, they keep a list of, the financial institutions in good standing and they update it for the investment houses, the Securities and Exchange Commission, sec.gov.gh. So you can go there. Um, if it's pe- related to pensions, it's, N- it's the National Pensions Regulatory Authority, that's NPRA. I'm not sure of the, the website. Is it npra.gov.gh? I can just, yeah, looks looks like that is the correct. Um, yeah, npra.gov.gh. You check on the website, you go through, the, they all keep a list of members or their, yeah, people who should be reporting to them who are of good standing. If you don't see a name there, or if you see some kind of exclamation, I know SEC has color coding, gold, red, you know, those kind of things, then you can inquire some more. But if you don't see something, that's when you need to even investigate some more to find out what's going on there. Then it comes to, generally speaking, people looking, trying to get into online investments, for the longest time, when people ask me, how do I buy stocks outside of uh, Ghana? Put away my normal investing uh, concerns. I just, a major concern I have is with security. A lot of these official firms, uh, the proper firms that were popular, Robin Hood, um, Betterment, even I think Franklin Templeton, um, I've forgotten some of the the major names um, that allow you to buy and sell mutual funds or buy and sell stocks. They don't allow people from outside of the U.S. to invest with them. And that's, there are reasons why they need to do have certain protections. So they are like, okay, keep it strictly for the U.S. people. So foreigners wanting to invest into, into those kind of markets, they have to go through other parties. Now, if you are not too sure of the party, then you have to ask yourself, like, is it worth the risk, though? Like, yeah, I want to. You want to buy Apple stocks, but whatever, how, whichever exchange you are going to use, is it worth the risk? It raises the question, and I was going to talk about other scams that have come up, and a major one is FTX. 
I don't know of anyone who or any Ghanaian who's invested in FTX, but I was following the story. I there's the in Nigeria there's a whole club and somebody was actually going to um set up a school to train people on cryptos and FTX and all that, like and he was affected. He had already paid like one third of the down payment for a piece of land in his hometown so that he could build that school. So people could get affected. But the question is how do you know which um which institution you can trust people thought ftx was bigger they do a lot of adverts but some of these things are not proxy like men's good yeah they saw him taking pictures with the president i think for like people popular people that's not a proxy you know so you need to go find out who the regulators are you can't outsource all your due diligence a hundred percent um mimi let's let's hear from you and then we can come back to you let, let's hear him speak now Okay, all right. So, um, Hi, Elikim. Well, I also wanted to add to um, not outsourcing your not outsourcing your due diligence. Another thing you should, as you mentioned, yes, look at the regulators. Also, you can as well look at the key personnel, right behind the company. So sometimes it really helps if you are dealing with an online um, company. At least, thank God, there's LinkedIn. If the person says the person is a, has a CFE certification, I mean, the key uh, personnel behind the company, they say they have this certification or whatever, go to this and then check. Because these are all parts of the due diligence. Checking, knowing the key personnel behind the institutions. It's all part of the due diligence due diligence process don't as Ellie Kim has said don't just outsource that thank you that's what I wanted to add thank you thank you Sarah and yes a lot of these organizations like especially the CFA um, uh, institutes you can actually go search for somebody's name on their database to see if they are really a member in good standing okay Mimi back to you yeah, I think Lee said something and I was just wondering. I think you've said this thing before. I think Ghanaians are not ready for um honest <laughs> They are not ready for honest Mimi, discussion. Finish finish the thing. Why are you laughing? You finish what you are saying. So no, know... because this is what I've noticed, mm-hmm. okay. The reason why people you are talking about this uh, uh, this uh, financial independence thing and blah blah, the reason why people um, can't have real discussions is that for some reason in Ghana people prefer to be lied to. That is what I think. You can argue your points. People prefer to be lied to. You tell me that they are guaranteed returns. That's, they just want to be just mention guaranteed and I'm okay. I think that thing is a reason why, of course, the institutions have a part to play, but I think that's a reason why things are the way they are. So re- more recently, the conversation has been about, okay, this investment is available, but these are the risks. As soon as you mention risk, then they say, oh, mekwaba, that's the end. <laughs> so, I'm just wondering, do people want to have these, you know, honest conversations? Because the reality is that when you invest, there will be risk, you know, and you need to know what kind of risk is, you you know, is involved so that you know, you know, what to do or how to go about it. But I don't think that we are ready for that conversation. At least the few people I have interacted with, that's the vibe. Um, I am getting from that. So I think that we ourselves, we should be very open-minded when it comes to investing. I think what we've been doing is not re- is investing, but not really investing. You know, with all this um, drama that happened last year um, has pushed the need for us as individuals to really understand what investing is before we put our money in places because people are investing with the mindset that they are doing some kind of insurance. And I say insurance because of the guaranteed. So it's like you are doing an insurance without paying the premium. I don't know who you expect to take the risk, but you're expecting guaranteed 
uh, returns. And I think that opens you up to be scammed by anybody. That expectation, you know. And once you come and I tell you that um, these are the benefits, these are the risks, and you want, you still, you, you run away because I've mentioned to you the other side. After a while, I'll just talk about the benefits. I won't talk about the risk. I think that's that's what will happen in the industry. So just just add into that. Mm, people like to hear sweet things. It's it's true. Not wanting to accept the reality. It's in life, there's risk with everything. There's risk with everything. Anyway, anyway, um, Jet Lee, back to you. I nearly said Jet Lee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah i think Mimi has just put everything into perspective because at the end of the day yeah it is no we want the goodies but we don't want to deal with the the bad side of the goodies too so but i think the the little advice i'll have for anyone investing in ghana now is be be a hundred percent involved in your investment because anything can happen because it might not even be the bank's fault but anything can happen so um you you should be very involved in your investment right and i think um what set um warren buffett aside when it comes to investing he he digs into the company he's investing before he puts in any money he literally digs in and in some occasions he literally comes to say you know what you have potential and i think it is best you look at this as well and then um, go this direction and most of the time it has even helped even the companies he 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 put his money in right so know know the investment you are doing so that when they there's they are making something that no this is the time i have to withdraw or this is the time i have to put in more so yeah we should be involved in our investments that's the little i can summarize it now all right, all right. On the topic of being involved in your investments, a gentle reminder, go check all your statements. From your pension statements, that's SNIT for tier one. Check your statement. If they are not sending it to you monthly, get get uh, get on the portal and ensure that you get it monthly. Download it, save it somewhere, preferably on a cloud somewhere that you can always retrieve it. Your tier two, uh, your tier two statements. If you have tier three to go and check anywhere you've, you've invested money, just check your statements at least every six months. Keep keep those records there. You never know when you need them. I recall when one financial institution uh, had their license revoked some time back in the way the liquidator was handling it. They, they didn't even know how much they owed who. So people had to bring their own statements to determine that this is how much we are owed before they rebuild their balance sheets to figure out what's, what's going on in there. So you always make sure that your records are fine. That way, if something goes wrong for any reason, you you have something to stand on. The topic has been when celebrities get scammed, and we've been talking mainly about Usain Bolt, his $12.7 million, which has been lost. He invested it in a firm in... in in Jamaica, and the firm is saying that one employee has confessed to stealing all this money from 30 or 40 clients, and they are saying the whole grand scheme of things is $3 billion. Oh, this thing had been had started from 2010 till now. As to the veracity of the amount in the single culprits, that's a whole different story. Um, hope We hope this will be investigated and we can get some money from it. But yeah, broadening it and going beyond Usain Bolt situation, other celebrities, some some things that came up. FTX, I'm sure we all know about FTX. They did a lot of advertising. Maybe we didn't hear about it a lot in Ghana. I didn't until the scandal came up. They are a crypto exchange. They had their own coin and all that. They did a lot of lobbying. The irony is the, um, the founder, Sam Bankman Fried, was... On, was trying to get a, get regulation, trying to change the laws so that there can be regulation of the crypto sector. Maybe he knew why he wanted that regulation, or maybe he was innocent. We'll let the courts decide. 
just yesterday or the day before, it was on the news that one of his co-founders, I think he's the chief of prison officer for one of the firms, um, p- pled guilty to fraud charges and is going to cooperate with the prosecution against Sam Bankman Fried. So we are watching how that one will also turn out. There have been other ones. There's, I'm sure everyone may, most people may have heard of Benny Madoff. He really liked the celebrities, like the, the number of celebrities who were, who've been, who've had their money lost to Benny Madoff. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. And when you actually delve into the numbers of Benny Madoff, you'd realize the way he did his Ponzi scheme was that he was just providing steady returns to his customers. Nothing extraordinary. Nothing out of nothing too high, nothing too low, just steady returns. Despite the 2008 crisis, he was still consistent. Throughout any downturns, he was still consistent to the point where peop- somebody who blew the whistle, to, well, somebody who alerted a journalist, he said he he was in a competitor's firm and they asked, he was an analyst, he was asked to try to figure out how um, Benny Madoff was able to generate those returns. So he has to rework it, create models, do simulations. That's like, if I also did these same investments, because to some extent, some of the information was public after a while. And I was like, if I did these same investments, what's the likelihood of me making these same returns? And it was effectively statistically impossible. But, you know, when people are getting their monies and the Ponzi scheme is going, there's more money coming in to feed the money going out. Everybody will be fine. Everybody will be happy. But, uh, well, he was given, a, after all was said and done, he was given a 153, 150-plus year um, um, jail term. So he's still serving his time there. A lot of the celebrities, when I, was, I did some research, maybe their credit cards, people got a hold of their credit cards and were using it. Many, most of them have been issues of their own business managers, people that they trust in their own inner circle, that they trust with their business, running away with them, defrauding them, or financial advisors. And you know, these financial advisors, they don't have just one, one, one celebrity. They usually have a bunch of celebrities. So they will just be collecting, doing like tax collection or susu. Collect from here, collect from here. And to come to a nice round sum of thirty, fifty million dollars after taking some from each person. So the celebrities are not having it easy at all. So it all boils down to trust. Again, who can you trust? Um it's a it's a key question you should be asking. Perhaps a last example I'll give is there was Elton John. One he had he had a, an account with a firm or they were managing his accounts and they he stole they stole twenty nine million of his money it was alleged that he stole twenty nine million dollars of his money, and he tried suing them. He got was it Ernst and Young and Arthur and Anderson, like audit firms back then, to try to figure out how the money was stolen, how much was actually stolen. He sued the firm and all that, and at the end of it all, there wasn't enough evidence, so they had he had to drop the case, and by then he had already spent about ten million dollars in legal fees just to even figure out what was going on so again it all boils down to trust right yeah so um the key lesson here for us really is who can you trust you even when you are trusting someone you have to verify you have to figure out ways to verify maybe you get a third party involved you we give a whole bunch of tips um, that you can use but don't trust anyone 100 percent always try to verify Okay, great. Um, Lee, did you want to say something? And then we can have uh, we can just go around do by closing remarks on this issue. Trust if even celebrities can guess can how much more us. Yeah, um, I think with the with Usain Bolt's um, investment, I don't think uh, they are seeing almost thirty million. But I think his investment, his personal. Um, the money is pushed into the investment wouldn't be up to that much. Probably. So let me just clarify these numbers. It's alleged that it's twelve point seven million was what he had in his account that has disappeared, and then um, they are saying for the larger bank, it's about three billion dollars. That's what they are saying. 
And when I look at his net worth, I'm seeing figures like $90 million. So not, not all his eggs were in that basket. Yeah. So, um, like I said, uh, okay. Um, he, he, his money manager or financial money or whatever. You know, sometimes as human as we are, right? Sometimes you can get overexcited, right? Like, oh, I'm responsible for this. Um, and then it might not be intentional, right? But then, Charlie, I'm doing a good job and the returns are coming in. So why not risk it even more? Right. So um, for me, I, whether he was in, in court with the whoever at the bank, or I think this thing also had a role to play where probably they are doing um, investments and they are getting the returns and overconfidence, right? Oh, uh, you, let me just do it. When the returns come in, he'll be happy. So let me, you know, let me just push the money here when the returns come. All that matters is the returns are coming. I think sometimes these things also get into that. So uh, sometimes um, we have to, uh, like I said, be involved, right? So that when there's an investment going on, if there's a loss, you know that, okay, I gave my consent and there's been a loss. We go another day. But if you are going to leave everything to, say, your financial manager or financial advisor or whoever you do with at the bank and some of these things happen, you also have to take a blame because, yeah, it is your money, but where were you when you were investing the money? Did you give the go-ahead? And you have to be involved, like I said. Be very involved and like, okay, um, I've heard there's this investment going on. Please don't put my money in it. I don't want my money in these kind of things. So sometimes you have to go the extra mile too, you know. And like you said earlier, don't trust a hundred percent because anything can happen. Someone can be overconfident and say, "Oh, let me let me use this guy's money." And uh, yeah, so I I I was told some time back banks had to introduce a policy of dormant accounts because they realized tellers were um, taking out money from people's accounts, especially the elderly, who really do withdrawals. They sort of claim they are borrowing monies to go and do stuff and then bring them back and stuff like that. I don't know how true, but I, I hear that was the basis of the introduction of the dormant account. Okay. All right. Thanks for sharing those concluding tips. Mimi, how about you? What's the question again? <laughs> Any final advice to our audience? Um, I, I also, um, like you said, I don't think you should trust anyone 100%. Not because anyone is bad, but actually it's your hard earned money. And so you should be suspicious of everyone a bit, not too much, but a bit enough to, you know, do some extra checks. You know, I, I think that is important. And as you, you guys have said, sometimes, um, uh, what do you call it? You can use different people or people like to call individuals numbers too much. Sometimes call the call center. <coughs> call the call center so that you know whether the, pick, the person pick. is... They will pick. <laughs> uh, like... I don't even want to talk too much. And I think that's the issue, you know? That's the challenge. At least I have had that challenge of when I was on maternity leave, I didn't pick certain calls and they went to report me. That, that's another story for another day. But I'm like, <laughs> like <laughs> the company is there for your money to the company. Just call and let, let, let them sort you out. People like, they want that personal thing. And it's good, but sometimes the disadvantage of that is if the person means you harm, that is it, you know. But at least, even if I signed you up and you are um, calling for your statement or something, and then you call call center, or some, even though it's more a, a more annoying process, you, at least you another person will confirm that indeed you have money there than always, you know, calling me. So I think that's also another way um, 
to go about it. And then, Charlie, if you are not sure, don't put all your, your money there. These days, I, mean, I don't even, even governments, we can't trust governments now. So for me, I would say that don't put all your, your eggs in one basket, honestly. That's, that's something I would say. Um, yeah, and, and let's be interested in investment. I think the time for just putting your money and sleeping somewhere and expecting that you'll be a millionaire, I think that time is over. We need to be a bit more interested in our and our investments. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mary, for sharing this. This call center matter. It's, it's, it's reminding me of the good old days. It's funny how sometimes somebody calling the call center will actually have their problem resolved and me, me going to chase it down for some weird reason. And people just didn't get why. Because I don't work on that kind of thing. They are closer to it and they can actually put it on a prop formal log. And when it's on the proper log, People make sure it's gotten done. When you go and come oh, and it doesn't get on any log. <laughs> if if the person doesn't mind me or the person thinks I looked at them, thinks I didn't give the, share my job with them sometime here and they have a beef with me. <laughs> if they don't get it done, it's jokes on you. But yeah, uh, that's that's a bit on the light and road. And like with my previous employer, a major thing that was that if if an employee is part of a transaction, a client's transaction. It requires even more signatures for it to just go through. Like my mother, it was a time when my mother was doing a withdrawal for me. I had to buy something, and she was she had traveled, and she was doing it. She was doing it through another brand, but she wanted it to come to me so that I could go and do something. Oh no, no, that even worsened the situation entirely. You know, because they're like, okay, what's going on here? It's, there, there, are, there are flags to on on these on employee involved transactions just to make sure that employees. I'm not trying to do any funny business. So, yeah, call the call center. <laughs> Adam, how about you? Any closing remarks for us? Yeah. Um, I think what I would say in conclusion is that um, this case we are dealing with too was not, I, I don't, it didn't come off as though it was an unregulated um, business like in, the, in so many cases that we, we, we we found out in Ghana where people are operating without license or, or without without the regula- regulator's knowledge. This seemed to be, a, I think, a, a properly registered and so probably properly regulated company. And so that tells us that it can go wrong even with places where the regulator is, is overseeing the activities of the company. So it then means that we have to always be on our guard and on our alert. So like, I think everyone has basically said that, I think what some of the auditors normally say is they say, well, trust, but verify. So yeah, we trust them. We, we trust their instincts. We trust their professions. We trust the fact that they will do the right thing. But can we just please verify that they are actually doing the right thing? And, uh, whatever it is, I mean, whatever red flags, or sometimes you see, just follow your gut. If you have a some gut feeling about something, Charlie, ask questions. And I feel that's one of the things that sometimes we don't do too much in these parts where we question things and we ask questions or we demand some form of answers to things we are not clear about. And it doesn't matter. It's our hard-end money. So if something happens to it, it's, it's, it's us that are affected negatively. I think as per the article, we realized that this is money he said he was saving up for his pension. And uh, so, I mean, he's gone by the books, prepared for his pension, his retirement, and he's thinking about his children's future. So it's something that you would expect that attention is given to it. So all the monies we are putting aside, probably you are saving up for a project, you are saving up for a new business or something, and you've put the money in there. You should be interested in what is going on over there. If you are not receiving statements, please find out what's the problem. Why are you not getting your statements as you're supposed to be getting it? And I think one thing you could also do is that in, as part of our general budgeting and financial, uh, personal finance dealings, we should allocate time frequently, probably like Elika mentioned, maybe twice in a year, okay, where you review 
statements of all your holdings. Where is your money? I think and sometimes we even forget that we have money at certain places because you are not regularly checking up on all of this. I, for example, I have a spreadsheet of detailing everything that I have. So I regularly go through. So if it's, you could do that, check your statements, cross check, anything that has flagged that looks off, call the investment house or the bank the next day or go there just to verify anything. And probably if there's anything, it will, it will show up and then you can deal with it. So you don't, find yourself in a situation like this. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Looks like Prince dropped to the listen-only mode. You know, Prince is a big man, so maybe he's, he's caught up doing something. But um, yeah, Adam, Adam would use spreadsheets. Me, small boy like me, they'll use notes part. The tiny ones on. So yeah, keep track of your, your money. I'd just like to leave us with uh, some final words, some um, uh, from an article I read. This is from CBS Sports. And uh, let me just read what they said. And I'm quoting the news article on cbssports.com. And it said, Bulls referred to the scandal as a sad situation, Re- referring specifically to the elderly customers who have been affected by the fraud. Bulls let on that he was as confused as the public but maintained that his focus would remain on uplifting his country despite the turmoil being experienced in Jamaica's financial system. And now this part is a quote. He said, No matter what's going on right now, Jamaica is my country. That will never change. So, yeah, that's that's the perspective from both, despite all that's happening. I, I, I hope that we can all keep some hope alive I know that in Ghana too and many African countries, many developing countries, a lot of things are going wrong. But let's keep the faith and um, try to do what we can to improve the systems in our, in our various countries and in whatever small corner, in whatever small way we can do that. Okay, and one way you can definitely do that is by following Money Convos here on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, get on YouTube, go... Uh, subscribe, just search for Money Convos everywhere. Um, wherever you listen to your podcast, to go, let's go subscribe there and listen to our conversations. We have older conversations that are there, and whenever we have our discussions, we upload them. Uh, we had some technical challenges last week, but we'll be uploading last week's uh, in, a, in a couple of hours when I'm done with this conversation. Um, Last week, we spoke about uh, the cash shortage in Nigeria. Before that, we spoke about black tax. So there are a lot of good conversations we've had in the past. I encourage everyone to just go listen to some and uh, get the necessary knowledge to make sure that you're financially independent. You can become financially independent. Also, get on Instagram and follow Investment Friend. They provide a lot. Uh, they provide personal finance coaching for women. And they also give, share a lot of very entertaining and useful content on Instagram. So do follow them and spread the world about spread the word about investment friend. That's investment underscore friend on Instagram. Okay guys, thank you all so much for your time this middle of the week. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Oh yeah in Ghana I heard six six March Charlie six March I heard some of my friends are going to be traveling. It's a long weekend. Monday is a holiday in Ghana so people are going to have a long weekend. So uh, please do um do eat some extra fufu on my behalf, okay? Fufu banco and tilapia. As you eat it, do so in remembrance of me, and uh, enjoy the long weekend when it comes. All right, guys, do take care. You got me to ask. Say something. Say something. You enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I, I like tilapia. Even with fufu, I like tilapia with the fufu. Or if it's banco with pepper, then catfish too is allowed. Or two hey, that, that reminds me of how hot fish I ate in Syria. Hey, you people are there enjoying yourselves. Finally, it was a killer hot fish. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank 
you for taking the time to listen to our thoughts. I hope you learned a thing or two and start practicing. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse and Facebook. And subscribe to our YouTube and podcast. Do tell a friend about Money Convos so we all become wealthy together. Talk to you soon. Bye.